This is Joel in Portland, and we are still in the midst of the second Portland series. The subject tonight is a higher meditation, and the thought for this came from a note in uh, my notebook. How can we look upon a flower without letting the thought wander gently back of the flower to the divine influence that could give us such beauty of form and color, such perfume and grace? Is it possible to view the grandeur of mountains, valleys, and seas without thought going back of the visible to the invisible? Students pay particular attention to this entire reel. You have some uh, deep ideas for study. Love. To understand the source of these flowers, trees, oceans, mountains, is to better enjoy and love the outer symbols, just as to know and understand the mind and soul of an artist gives greater appreciation of joy, of realization in his work. Before me sits a tiny carved ivory figure and at once there flashes into my thought the invisible man who carved this bit of grace and beauty, and even further to the beauty of soul and purity of mind that guided and gave skill to the fingers of the artist. Feeling something of his love for his subject, sensing something of his affection for the piece of ivory itself, so carefully selected. I feel more the life, beauty, art, and skill which is shown forth in this tiny figure. And so, understanding God even a little, I am better able to discern the life, love, the joy he has embodied in man and the universe. And so I am enabled better to understand and to love all creation. Because of this, my own life and love expand and become more pure, joyous, and understanding. This step that we are taking tonight in uh, higher meditation will make clearer to you the fact that the infinite way leads us into a higher dimension of life. We live in a higher dimension of life. We live not so much in the world of effect as in the world of cause. We find our good, not in effects, not in things, not in persons, nor in places, but in the cause of all that exists. And the more we understand cause, God, spirit, the more enjoyment we get out of all effect, out of all persons and things. We understand them better, love them more. Now you all see here this beautiful little ivory carving. 
that is on this desk. And uh, first of all, let me tell you of the love, invisible love, that surrounds that peace. To begin with, it came to me as a gift from one of our students in Rangoon, Burma, who had what we would call a nice healing. And uh, as a token of her appreciation, and knowing that I have a collection of little art objects gathered in many places in the world in my travels, she brought back from Burma to me in Honolulu on Christmas Day this little piece. And so while sitting up here, all that is visible of it is the ivory figure. Actually, now we know a little more about it, and we can appreciate it more because now we know something of the invisible love that brought that to me and from me to you. And I would like to know what in particular struck you as you saw or handled this piece? Would someone tell me of something that struck them about it? The position of the hands, all right. The serene expression on its face, very good. what I'm waiting for. Yes, the cause of the inspiration. Can't you just look at that figure and picture the man who carved it? Can you imagine what was in his heart, in his mind, as he selected that particular piece of ivory, watched the grain of it, the color of it, the purity of it. And then as he went to work on a little piece of ivory, now remember that this entire figure is at most two inches wide at the widest point and two and three quarters inches high at the highest. And there is the full figure of a man seated on the lotus the Buddha seated on the lotus. Now can you imagine what love probably for the subject of Buddha, what love for the ivory, what love for his artistry and skill went into that, that in that small space he could show what one lady saw, uh, the unusualness of the hands. And another one, the serenity of the face. Think of that on a tiny little piece of ivory, the serenity of the face. Now, to the world, there is nothing sitting there but an ivory carving. And yet, to us here, there is now the love surrounding it, that brought it here, uh, the evidence of the Christ in healing that is responsible for its being here. There is not only the beauty of the hands and the serenity of the face, but there is to us an actual awareness, an actual feeling within us of the love that was in the heart and the soul and the mind of the man that did that piece. Now don't you see that because we know the love of the student who sent it and we know the love and uh, whatever else you can perceive in the consciousness of the artist, we can appreciate that visible figure the more. We can appreciate it now much more than we saw it first when it was nothing more nor less than a piece of carved ivory. 
Well, and so it is here. Here we have the branch of a little tree, a plant, and so far as the visible eye sees, it's nothing more nor less than that, just a little branch with some buds and a few colored flowers on it. And now, I ask you to look at it again. And, uh, As you look, try to see into the invisible realm that surrounds this and try to understand what produced it. The life, the presence, the power, that which is summed up in the word nature. Just think of what was in operation on a seed. Think of what is in operation in a seed, in the soil, that would appear outwardly as buds and blossoms and leaves of such beautiful shape and color. Try, if you can, to look through this branch, back of it as it were, into the invisible realm and see the operation of an intelligence and of a love that could appear to us in this magnificent form. As you do that, you will begin to see that this branch in and of itself is nothing, just like that figure in and of itself is nothing, until you begin to perceive the miracle of that which produced it, of that which is really the life of it, the love of it, the soul of it, that which gives unto it its color, grace, form, perfume, usefulness. Now, as we learn to look upon every figure, whether of art or whether of nature, and not spend too much time in admiring or valuing it, but immediately get into the background and try to perceive something of the nature of the cause of it, of that inspiration that appears here outwardly as form, beauty, color, usefulness, so forth, you know all the qualities that are here in this plant and in this figure. Now, we who study this message of the infinite way are those who have come to appreciate that there is always more than meets the eye. There is always something deeper, grander, more wonderful that is in the realm of the invisible and that whatever that presence or power is in the invisible is that which is made manifest to us as the visible, inseparable and indivisible. Don't think for a moment that the soul and the mind and skill of the artist isn't right there in the, the figure. It's appearing to us as uh, this carving, not something separate and apart from it. It's all there. And don't think for a minute that the activity, the life and love of nature is something separate and apart from this plant. It isn't. The life of this plant, the substance, the reality of it, is formed here as 
the color, grace, and beauty of the plant. It is only through entering this fourth dimension of life, this realm of the invisible, that we begin to perceive a law at work, and a law which is love, and then to understand that all that appears is the form and activity of that which is invisible. And we find then why the Master's teaching is so clear on the I have meat that the world knows not, or I have water. If you'd ask me, I could give you water. Invisible, surely. But this invisible water would spring up into wells of eternal life. And so we learn from these experiences, from these illustrations, that the Master was taking us back to the invisible realm, that which no man has ever seen, heard, tasted, touched, or smelled with the physical senses, but which any man may perceive with his inner spiritual faculties. And they learn not only of the realities, but of the cause of all that exists, and thereby bring out harmony. You see, it is only in proportion as we see these objects as something in and of themselves that we can come into accident, that we can come into disease, that we can come into lack and limitation, because we see them separate and apart from the substance that brought them into expression. Once, however, you learn this idea of perceiving that the visible is but the appearing in form, as form, of that which caused it, created it, gave it life, animation, beauty, then you will see that because the form is inseparable and indivisible from its cause that even the form is eternal. There is our great lesson. We have, even in this modern age, deaths. Whether you call it passing on or call it dying is of little moment. To the world, uh, they are deaths. And why? because we have accepted the belief that this form that you see is me and is my life and it is separate and apart from the universal life which gave it its expression its form color figure all that it has even its intelligence and uh, compassion and life and love all of those things that are embodied as me we see them as separate and apart from their source, and therefore we say, why, in three score years and ten, they'll be all worn out and die. Whereas the moment we begin to perceive this invisible essence that is actually the life, law, principle, cause, substance, activity, of my individual life, then my individual life and that universality become one and it becomes immortal and eternal and it's impossible even for the form to disappear or die. Now, our great question is how do we attain that consciousness which realizes the immortality and uh, the infinite nature of its own being, your being and mine, since we know that we are infinite being if infinity is the measure of our cause. And we've learned that one of these ways is meditation. 
And meditation has never been an easy subject to learn, to understand in the Occidental world, and in these days even less so in the Oriental world, because they have drifted away from the original understanding of the meaning of meditation. And so we are going to meditate now on a higher plane than we have done before. I am going to ask you to, instead of closing your eyes fully, close them about three quarters, leave a slit there that you can see through, and look up here at this uh, branch, at these leaves, at the buds and flowers, and as you meditate, and now close your eyes about three quarters, just leave enough room to see this, and uh, don't think of persons, and don't think of problems, and don't think of anything in this outer world. We want to go now into the fourth dimension, into the invisible realm. We want to go into that which the world can neither see, hear, taste, touch, nor smell with its physical senses. And so in looking at this, try in your mind to visualize the forces of nature that operated to bring this forth. Remember, first of all, the seed planted in the ground, just a seed, nothing but a seed, and planted where? In dirt, plain dirt. And out of that combination of a seed and plain dirt, look what has sprung. Now, what miracle has wrought this? What miracle of invisible activity, an activity that couldn't even be followed or seen with the most powerful microscope? Just think of this invisible life force that first touched the seed and broke it open and enabled little shoots to take root in the ground. And imagine the moisture from the soil going through those shoots and feeding it. And then the minerals or other elements in the earth that were drawn into these little shoots to feed them. And watch the product as we next have an entire root system and then the shoots coming up above the ground and all the rest of the development of the plant on up into a tree branches, leaves, buds, flowers and every single bit of this visibility coming out of where? the invisible, all through an activity unseen to our senses, unknown to us really humanly, and then marvel. And if you like, be a fool and say, there is no God. Or otherwise look and say, yes, only God. Only the infinite invisible, only the unknown and the unknowable could produce out of a tiny seed and a patch of dirt this beauty, this color, this form, this grace. And go from there to our little figure and try to visualize that artist sitting there with a blank piece of ivory. Oh, an ivory that he has first probably spent hours or days selecting for its color, for its beauty, for its purity, for its grain. Think of the love 
that went into that choice first of that piece of ivory and then of the fondling of it in his hand as he commences to perceive in his mind the form that is to appear in ivory think of as you look at that figure think what love he must have had of this idea of Buddhahood remember he wasn't carving a man since Buddha isn't a man Buddha is enlightenment Buddha is a state of divine consciousness Buddha is what we of the Occident call the Christ the Spirit of God in man the spiritual son and here is this artist pondering the idea of the Christ of a spiritual activity and wanting to bring it forth into form so as to give to others the delight also of seeing that which symbolizes the invisible Christ that which shows forth in visible form the invisible qualities and activity of the Christ perhaps some of you have seen the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor and can see what I mean when I say that there is no such thing as liberty in an outlined form liberty is a quality of being there was an artist filled probably heart overflowing with the idea of freedom liberty joy and he had to give it expression in some form that you and I could enjoy what he was inwardly visualizing visioning enjoying and he wanted to share us to share that joy but of course he couldn't take us into his inside that we might see what he was seeing and feeling in the name of liberty and freedom and so he brought it forth in tangible form as the statue of a woman upholding a lamp with stars in her hair and there again you have the idea look at the Statue of Liberty but look through it and you see the miracle of love and of life that appears now outwardly as this great figure and so we do with this little one just imagine a man with a divine ideal of Christhood wanting to share it with us in tangible form and he brings it forth as this figure sitting on the lotus the lotus you know is symbolic of spiritual purity and spiritual integrity therefore he has to give this figure a foundation and he is given it the lotus seated on the lotus seated within its own spiritual integrity and impurity that's the idea that is conveyed to us from the invisible to the visible now all meditation should take this form all meditation should take you back from the realm of the visible to the realm of the invisible where you can ponder the divine idea God where you can contemplate the divine reality God where you can enjoy thrill within you to the idea of the great first cause where you can fill your consciousness with a realization of the meaning of divine love a divine love that appears outwardly in these infinite wonderful forms appears as the divine grace beauty grandeur this form of meditation 
may even look at a sunset, a mountain, starry sky. Looking at it, and then looking through it, and again realizing the sky showeth forth his handiwork. The earth manifests his glory. All of the invisible, all of the love and the skill and the art and the beauty and the integrity of the invisible appearing to us in wondrous visible form. Without this invisible, there would be no visible. And without the continued activity and without the continued divine love, there would be no continuity of this magnificent creation called man and the universe. We live by grace, by grace of an invisible presence, an invisible power that is forever pouring itself out as creation, as manifestation, as expression, just as this artist has poured himself out as this beautiful little figure, just as nature has poured itself out in this beautiful branch, flower, bud, leaves. This meditation may likewise look upon man, woman, child, animal, looking at them, taking no note of their faults or failures, look through them to their divine origin, to all the forces of the invisible that join together bring about this visible expression of intelligence, life, love, form, joy. Think of the qualities of that invisible that are embodied in every individual, just as looking at this plant. Think of all the qualities of the invisible, moisture of the rain, light and warmth of the sun, minerals and substances of the earth that have been poured into this plant and now appear as this plant. And then think of all the qualities of life and of love and of truth, of joy and of compassion. Think of all of the great wisdom that God has embodied in every man, woman, child, animal on the face of this globe. God has embodied itself. God has embodied its own qualities in individual being. You won't see this by looking at man, woman, or child's figure any more than you can perceive all that we have perceived in this ivory figure, all that we have perceived in this little branch of a plant. You won't see all this by looking them in the face alone, but by looking through them to the invisible cause, then you see all this grandeur appearing. And so it is if you look at man, woman, and child. Look them in the face, look them in the body, you won't see what I'm talking about. But you look through them with all of the spiritual understanding that you can bring to bear and try to understand how God has embodied itself, its qualities, its activities, its own being in every individual. And that every individual is a presentation, a witness, an expression,
expression, a formation of that infinite divine itself pouring itself out. And then see how great your love will grow for this universe and for its people. And with it will come a deep compassion for those who know not their own identity, those whom we call the evil men and women of the world, and we won't condemn them, but we will be enabled to understand the Master as he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Let's not hold it against them. It is their ignorance. Let's forgive them 70 times 7. Why don't you know that if every man on earth knew what we know about these flowers and plants, that no man or woman would ever let a day go by without having some little bud somewhere about them? Do you know that if every man or woman on earth knew what we know about this little ivory piece, that no man or woman would ever permit themselves to go a day without looking on some form of artistic beauty or listening to some form of beautiful music? They couldn't. They couldn't if they realized the depth of the wisdom and the beauty of the infinite invisible that produced them. It was Mohammed who said, if I had two loaves of bread I would barter one and buy higher sense for the soul. Ah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. We would enter the fourth dimension of life where there are such beauties, harmonies, that the world knows nothing of. I have meat the world knows nothing of. I am the bread of life. I have water that springs up into life eternal. Oh, I have hidden mysteries the moment I begin to perceive that which underlies all creation, that which is the reality. And that our ancient Hebrew friends called keeping the mind stayed on God, leaning not unto thine own understanding, but acknowledging him in all thy ways. Or what Paul later called pray without ceasing. Now, meditation then has for its purpose the getting back to God. And you rightly say we've never strayed from God. Oh, but if we were only aware, if we were only aware that we have never strayed from God. We are all a part of humanity because we've accepted the belief that we've strayed apart from God and we are all a part of a truth study for the one purpose of getting consciously back to our oneness with God, to that place where we can say, I live and move and have my being in God. Now, here is the way that I have discovered of finding my way back to God, of keeping my mind stayed on God, of bridging over that terrible space from materiality to spirituality. I have found that because God is unknown to the human senses and God is unknowable to the human senses, that the only way that I can bridge over that space is when I meditate, <coughs> first of all, to let my thought drift from the world and its cares and its problems to some of the beauties of the world. Everyone has something in their home. 
Every church has something in it that one could look at. Beautiful picture painted by somebody. A little piece of chinaware that's been painted by somebody. Knick-knack here or there. And when nothing else, a flower, a plant, the simplest plant, a rubber plant will do. A farm. Anything that shows forth God's handiwork. And then, by first thinking upon them and then through them back to the infinite invisible, pondering the idea of how this activity formed itself and expressed itself through nature, through the mind of a composer, through the mind of a, an artist, sculptor, Gradually, we find ourselves going deeper and deeper and deeper. And one fine day, we've done it. We've actually found ourselves centered in God. And then we're not thinking anymore. Our thoughts are being uh, thought through us. Ideas are being thought through us. Impartations of the soul become apparent to our awareness, to our consciousness. Then we find God revealing itself, uttering the word that is quick and sharp and more powerful than a two-edged sword. That word of God that uh, separates the Red Sea when necessary, that produces the cloud by day and pillar by uh, fire by night, that which produces the miracles of our experience. Our meditations should carry us back through the visible to the invisible. That is the fourth dimension. Those who live in the third dimension live only in the world of height, width, and depth. In other words, the world of form. And they are completely cut off from the essence or substance or law or life or activity of that which appears outwardly as form. As we start out from the basis of God, the cause, God, the reality, the substance and law. Then we see that all effect, whether appearing as thing or man, all effect is but the showing forth of that infinite being God. All individual being, you and me, all individual form, animal, vegetable, mineral, is but the invisible God, life, pouring itself forth into expression, embodying its infinite qualities, nature, and character. And therefore, all of this earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof. All of it is God appearing as a universe, as man. All of it is immortal, all of it is eternal. All of it is yours and mine, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. Son, all that I have is thine. And again, I am ever with thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now that we've touched the invisible realm, we can understand why, how true. How could the love of that artist ever be separate and apart from that which it created? How can the skill, how can the purity of soul and mind of that artist ever be separate from the form it created? How can the greatness, the grandeur of nature ever be separate or apart from this form? And how can God the father and mother principle of our being ever be separate and apart 
from our individual being. How can we be separated from God? How can we be separated from good? I and the Father are one. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. Thou seest that ivory, you're also looking at the state of consciousness that evolved it. You look at this plant and you're looking at the divine nature that formed it. They are one, inseparable and indivisible. And I and the Father are one, and all that the Father hath is mine. God has embodied its qualities, character, and nature into my very being. My being is eternal and immortal, and when I say mine, I mean yours, because <clears throat> mine is yours as yours is mine, because it's all God appearing, the one life, the one soul. Now you see the depth of the meaning of meditation. Meditation is not just an abstraction. Meditation is not an occult practice for some mysterious purpose. Meditation is the getting back into God. Meditation is a process through which we keep our mind stayed on God and the things of God. Meditation is an activity of our consciousness opening to us the infinite invisible so that it declares itself within our own being, reveals itself as the health, harmony, and wholeness of our being. Meditation is the art of divine appreciation. Meditation is the art through which we learn to rightly appreciate each other and all the products of nature, and of man, and of art, and of music of literature, of scripture. Meditation gives us an appreciation of the outer form because it gives us an understanding of the divine love that produced the outer form. You know that when you know the author of a book, that makes the book more valuable to you, more enjoyable, more understandable. When you know the composer of a piece of music, that makes the music much more enjoyable. When you know the painter of a picture, the sculptor, certainly, once you know the mind and soul that produce the good, you can appreciate more the good itself. And so it is with all of us. Oh, if we could only know God. Oh, if we could only taste or taste touch one drop of God. If we could have an infinitesimal grasp on the divine reality we call God, how wonderful all creation would appear to be. And it is meditation that carries us back. Meditation that permits us to go right through the object or person back to its creative source or principle and then knowing it come back to the world again. The infinite way will open to you a new dimension of life because no longer will you be limited to time or space, to height, width, or depth. Because instantly your mind, your soul, will jump from the appearance, from the three-dimensional form to the fourth dimension of its origin, of its cause, of its source. That's the fourth dimension. Spirit, God, and the ability not to be dependent on things which do appear, whether as person or thing or place, not to be dependent upon them, 
not to overly love them, not to hate them, not to fear them. Why? Because if you look through them, you'll find that in every case the source is God. And whatever appears to be evil in the world of appearance represents but our misperception of the cause. When you hear, I will never leave you nor forsake you, won't you please remember our little figure and remember that the love and the artistry and the skill and the purity of soul and devotion of the artist cannot be removed from that figure. You cannot do it as long as that figure shows forth beauty grace, form, serenity of faith. Don't you know that the very mind and soul of the artist is there? Oh yes. And so it is with us. That which formed us will never leave us nor forsake us. That which formed us is in us. It's very qualities are still here. <coughs> to enjoy the life of the soul, to enjoy soul faculties, that is the higher wisdom, that wisdom which is above book learning, it becomes necessary to get back into the consciousness of soul, into the consciousness of God. And this is one way, this particular form of meditation is one way that I have found to do it. Instead of just sitting still and trying to blank the mind or think nothing or make a jump all the way from humanhood to God, try to go back through some visible form to the causative principle, the life and soul, and then come forward again and see the perfect creation. Bless you, thank you, bless you, thank you, bless you, thank you, bless you, thank you.